Hello and welcome to the Game Changers podcast. I'm Sue Anstis, a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust and CEO of Promote, one of the UK's leading sports communications agencies. I am so grateful to Barclays for supporting this series of the Game Changers, which will focus on trailblazing women in football. In 2019, Barclays announced the biggest ever sponsorship of women's sport in the UK as the Barclays FA Women's Super League became Europe's first fully professional women's football league. A huge amount of Barclays investment also went into establishing the Girls Football School Partnerships with the aim of ensuring that all girls in England have equal access to football as boys. And giving girls the same opportunities in football is certainly something that's close to the heart of my guest today. Dame Sue Campbell is Director of Women's Football at the FA and regarded by many as one of the most respected people in sport. Sue began her career as a PE teacher in the early 70s before going on to lecture in PE at Loughborough and Leicester Universities. She was a CEO at the National Coaching Foundation where we first met in the early 90s. And in 1995, Sue helped to found the Youth Sport Trust and went on to be CEO and then chair for many years. Sue was chair of UK Sport from 2003 to 2013, overseeing a step change in the delivery of British medals at the Olympics and Paralympics. In 2008, Sue was appointed to the House of Lords as a crossbench peer and earlier this year, she became a dame in the Queen's New Year's Honours list. I was lucky enough to meet Sue at the House of Lords for our interview, and you can certainly hear the workings of the House in the background, with the division bell ringing occasionally to call members to the chamber. We found a quiet corner in the magnificent building, and I began by asking Sue where her love of sport started very much as a child with incredible support from my parents you know any sport I wanted to try from ice skating to you know football to whatever I was given the opportunity to do so my love of the outdoors my love of playing sport came from those days and in these podcasts we often hear people talk about their female PE teachers way back when and I know you you've mentioned yours too so can you tell us a little bit about her Well, I had two teachers who had a big impact on me. One, surprisingly, was my primary teacher when I was five and six, seven. It was Mrs Jury, and Mrs Jury loved the outdoors, and um, she she taught us all sorts of things. I'm not sure she knew the rules of many of them, (laughs) but she encouraged us. That's where I first learned to to play in a team as opposed to on my own and, and play with others, which is something you have to learn. And then when I went to secondary school, my PE teacher was a Mrs Sheila Bassett, married to Ron, who was the men's PE teacher. Um, and she was fantastic and uh, a very good teacher, but also a really good mentor. And I wasn't doing very well academically, just couldn't apply myself. I was too busy looking out the window. And she did a really good job of sitting me down, helping me plan a future path and really encouraging and supporting me to, to sort of apply myself academically so I could get the qualifications to go on and be a PE teacher. Excellent. And you played football as a girl on the streets and at school as well. Do you think that football might have been your chosen sport if you'd had the opportunities that are there now? Would you have been a, a wild cat that went on to be a, a lioness, do you think? I'd like to think I'd have become a lioness. <laughs> um, I definitely, football would have been the sport of my choice. I didn't, I know this sounds absurd, but I didn't realise in a sense, that girls didn't play this game. I, From a very early age, I played with the boys. I never saw any other girls playing, but it never dawned on me. I think in that era, we weren't that aware of, yeah. you know, Peer whether pressure. we were boys or girls <laughs> or what we were. And there was no pressure on me to not play. Yeah, I think without any doubt, I would have carried on playing football. And, you know, one of the great things I admire about today's Lionesses is that many of them were confronted with the same message, Mm. girls don't play football, but they didn't allow that to stop them. And that's why I respect and admire them, so they found another way so that they could carry on playing the sport they loved. And and you went on to play netball for England, but that wasn't your first love. You meant, I didn't realise, the ice skating, but athletics as well featured discus and pentathlon. Yeah, Yeah, I was was a sort of uh, jack of all trades and master of none, really. I, I just loved anything. Um, and I always loved testing myself and 
the commitment to get better at whatever I did. So after five attempts, I won the All <laughs> England School Athletics Championships yeah, throwing the discus. Yeah. <laughs> but also at college, at PE College, I entered British University's pentathlon and won that. So I was British University's champion at the pentathlon, which was the precursor to the heptathlon. <laughs> and then I was also playing netball at the same time, got into the England under-21s, captain of the England under-21 netball team, and, and I guess put all my energies then into for a while into both and then chose netball. And how did your experience then as a representing England do you think differ from the Roses and the experience they have today? Oh crikey, uh, chalk and cheese. I think you know you have to remember that I was I was doing all this when Queen Victoria was on the throne. Um, international sport was just a very different thing. Yeah. It was you know you bought or borrowed your kit, you had to contribute to travel, there was no nutritionist, psychologist, physiologist. You know, my training for England was in a gym on my own, throwing a ball at a wall. That's how I trained so every yeah. night. And I would go and work out for an hour and then just, you know, I had no idea whether I was doing the right thing or the wrong thing, but I was, I was sweating and running and working <laughs> and I assumed it was right. But there was no evaluation of your physical condition or helpful training regimes. It was just... You got there by sheer personal effort. It's extraordinary, isn't it, that transformation across that time in terms yeah. of sports tech and science and that investment. Do you ever yearn for the days of more, not real sport, but sport for sport without the science? Yeah, I, I know what you mean by that sort of pure sport in that sense. Mm. Um, I guess I was part, though, of the revolution yes. because when I was at the National Coaching Foundation, we took all the ologies, as I call them, and, and, <laughs> and put them into bite-sized chunks and created this market stall approach. So our coach education was only the ologies and it was married with the sports technical and tactical knowledge and to begin with many sports didn't want um, what I had to offer but gradually everybody adopted it and now nobody thinks twice about the fact that the ologies are a fundamental part of preparation and I do I do think however many ologies you've got and however brilliant they are it comes back to that individual's desire in themselves to want to be the best that isn't something you can give someone mm -hmm. you can provide them with all the support in the world but they've got to want it and they've got to be able to make the sacrifices and do the hard work that gets them to the yeah. top that doesn't come from a lab or any it doesn't come from a scientist no. it comes from inside i remember going and watching them um, going up cycling where Dave Brailsford was and watching Chris Hoy, who'd just done a full session in the velodrome, but was on a stationary bike, going, 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 going. Everybody else had gone to the dressing room. And Dave said, you know, whether I was here or not, that guy is, has his own motivation. Yeah. He wants to be the best. It's inside him, just like a Steve Redgrave, a Catherine Granger, Jess Ennis Hill. You know, I mean, look at someone like Jess. She wasn't built to be a heptathlete. Right. She's tiny compared to most of the heptathletes. But she wanted to do it. And she had such great determination. Yeah. And any of these great athletes that you look at in any sport, it comes from within. You can surround them with the best but you can't do it yeah, for them. Yeah. And you were, I believe, you were the first female lecturer at Loughborough University. First or one of the full-time lecturer in physical education. Yeah, yeah I was. It, Loughborough was a physical education college and there was a technology college on the hill and the two combined to be Loughborough University and Loughborough had always been a men's PE college but because we were combining going up on the hill uh, with the university, they were going to admit women. They were a little worried about women's things I never quite <laughs> found out what women's things were so they, they invited me to join the staff to look after the oh, women I didn't realize that, that was yeah, the I case was there to look after women's things women's yeah thing. you did a good job yeah. I was proud to, to follow in though in the, being a student there and it was wonderful last year to be present when you were inducted into the, the Loughborough Hall of Fame and obviously you've had so many influential roles since then but I wonder what drove you beyond your early career the PE teacher at Mossai you talk about that a bit but how did that experience you think shape the rest of your oh. career it, yeah, no, it unquestionably shaped. Well, I've always said I'm a bit schizophrenic. I have two really deeply ingrained things I'm passionate about. One is young people. But what the experience in Wally Range made me realise that it wasn't just sport for sport's sake. It was how you could use sport to change lives. So the ultimate objective wasn't necessarily that you were going to produce good sports, men and women, well, women particularly, but that you had given them a better chance in life. And that has lived with me and, and followed me through the work I did when I worked for Sports Council in the inner city, when I worked at the Youth Sport Trust. And then the other part of me has always been this fascination with excellence. 
the youth sport thing comes right from inside my heart. It's it's me, I think. I think it's me, Sue Campbell, and realising just how much sport shaped my life, but recognising how important it can be for young people. You know, whether it's to improve their health, their behaviour, their togetherness, the cohesion of communities, all of that stuff that we've talked about is really important. But I have this other fascination, and that fascination is how do you create an environment in which you can take people who have the dreams, who have the aspiration, and help them be the best that they can be. So those two strands have kind of mm. followed me through life, really, and I've bobbed between the two. Brought them together as well, but come on to in some of the youth well, sport you, trust you, using you, one. Yeah, youth sport trust and UK sport was sort of an expression of those two. Mm. You know, one youth sport trust was my desire to use sport to change lives, and uh, UK sport was my fascination with excellence and mm. achieving the Olympic medal target. What football's given me is a chance to uh, to, to pull those two yes. into one family and to, to, to create a strategy which looks at both of those and has a sort of holistic view of how you can do both Together. successfully. You and I first met early 1990s when you were heading up National Coach Women Foundation and I was working for Quaker Oats and you did a fabulous oh, job of encouraging us to spend money, funnily enough, to sponsor yes. some of your programmes. That's not, never changed, has it? No. So I wonder what you feel now. I guess it's almost 30 years on, but in terms of the recognition that coaches get for all that they contribute, do you think that's changed across that time? I'd like to say yes. I th- I'm not sure it has. I think at the top level, people talk more. Uh, certainly in football, people talk about the team manager, who's the boss of the coaches or the coaching leader. Not always the person wearing the tracksuit, man, but the person who manages what's happening on in training and in practice and selection and all the other things. But really, could we name the coaches of our Olympic champions? Perhaps one or two, Mm. but not many. And certainly down at grassroots level, those coaches that go standing in the rain Tuesdays and Thursdays and supporting young people develop their skills, I just think they're unsung heroes that we just have never really understood or invested in in the way that we should and certainly not given the profile that they should have. And do you think that will change? I mean, it almost needs to change if you, we want more voluntary coaches. You know, there are many people who get involved in volunteering in sport who are not looking for somebody to give them a gong or a medal or pay them, but they do want to feel part of something. They want to feel like they belong. And I think the place I recognised how well we did that was around the London Olympics. The volunteer workforce mm. there. You still see people in those shirts, yeah. right? Um, I hope they've washed them. But, you know, <laughs> eight years on, they're still in those shirts. And, and that's, that's because they felt part, part of something. something yeah. And that's what most people want. They don't, they're not looking for somebody to pay them lots of money. Um, they're looking to make a difference, to improve opportunities, but also to feel like they belong to something bigger than just their own small effort. Mm. And that's why, you know, we're at the FA launching this Playmaker programme. It's a rip-off, really, of what happened in London 2012, <laughs> but it's an attempt to say, can we build an army of volunteers that we value, that feel like they're part of the big yeah. mission, and that have a, a sense of belonging and a sense of achievement that's beyond just their own contribution? Yeah, excellent. And in terms of elite sport, so females, and obviously the Game Changers podcast is very much about trailblazing and women, so in terms of senior female performance directors and so on, it does feel like there's not enough of those. Mm. Is that something that you would recognise and mm. will hope will change in the future? Yeah, I mean, when I first went into UK sport, the number of medals being won by women was was a very small percentage of, of the overall medal count. Now it's 50-50, and I think this time going to Tokyo, it looks like there'll be more female athletes yes. than male yeah. athletes. So in terms of the playing of the sports or the participation has definitely improved. But in terms of leadership roles like coaching, officiating, administration, boardroom, still a huge job to do, Mm. massive job to do. And part of that, I think, is making sure that first step on on that rung is not too, too big a rung and the perception is, it's not for me. And I think the only way to do that is to get more women over a much lower hurdle in the first instance because they're more than competent it's confidence it's how do we step over that line so things like our wildcats program you know encouraging the mums standing around there to say hey you know we've got this thing program you can do at home you can acquire some skills and knowledge and then you can become an assistant we've got to find an easy way to get people in and then having got them in 
we've got to find a way of nurturing and developing them. And when I first came into football and I looked how many A-licensed women coaches we'd got, they weren't huge, but we did have quite a number. Not one of them felt loved by us or valued or felt there was something there for them. And now Audrey Cooper oversees the whole of that for, for women's coaching. And Audrey has just launched a really exciting, innovative programme for our top top coaches about developing them as leaders and managers of the future. Excellent. So, you know, at every stage, whether it's recruitment and retention, whether it's progression or whether it's consolidation and growth at the top, we've now got a strategy in place for coaching. Joe Stimpson's trying to do the same thing in refereeing, slightly tougher in, in all sorts of ways. So it's it's about how do you create a pathway, yeah, just like yeah. you do for the performer, yeah, yeah. that allows you, <clears throat> allows you to progress and get to the top if you want to. Excellent. That's good. That's really good to hear. I, I it's positive looking forward and uh, I guess hope to see some change in the future there yeah. too. We have to see some change in the future, yeah, not hope. Indeed. We have to. <laughs> Taking you back a little bit then to the Youth Sport Trust, and I've heard you often talk about power <coughs> sport, as we've alluded to there, to uh, perhaps bring kids back from that wayward edge, um, being pulled back into sport and how sport changes lives. Why do you feel that sport has that power to reach those children especially those that might be alienated as you mentioned from traditional academics and so on well I guess I I was that child to some degree but I I think if we only engage with young people through an intellectual medium there are going to be many young people who can't make that journey that doesn't mean to say intellectual young people don't need to be physically active too they do But if you're talking about the young people we're talking about, I think there are three things. Sport can give you a strong sense of belonging, something we've just talked about. And for many young people, they're searching for that. Mm. That's why we have gangs. That's why we have groups that that get together and sometimes do bad things as well as good things because they want to feel part of something. Everybody wants to belong. And, you know, if for whatever reason your family isn't a tight unit or, you know, you're left on your own a lot... A lot of kids nowadays talk about feeling isolated Mm. because of our digital gadgets that we've all got. So they've got lots of people they communicate with, but no real friends. So that notion of isolation needs to get broken. So you need to use sport to create that sense of belonging. That doesn't mean you've got to be part of a team, but it means you can be part of a group that's engaged in something. The second bit is so many of these kids want challenge. Mm. You know, they want something that tests them. I remember once talking to a young man who had been stealing cars and I asked him to describe it to me and as he described it to me I said oh I I know exactly how you felt and he said why have you stolen a car (laughs) I said no I've played netball for my country (laughs) I said and what you describe you know that dryness of your mouth and the excitement and hearing your brain hearing your heart in your head I said that's all that excitement Mm. I introduced him to rock climbing and said to the guy who was teaching him, dangle him for all your worth, you know, <laughs> off the rock, frighten the devil to death, right? And um, it changed his life. Wow. It's so simple mm. because there's certain things kids are looking for. They want danger. They want a bit of risk. And we're so risk averse with our mm. kids. They want to belong. And thirdly, I think like puppies, you know, anybody who's got a dog will tell you, the only way you can control a dog is to give it enough exercise, <laughs> right? <laughs> it needs discipline, but it needs yeah. exercise. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a puppy, as I've got at the moment, and you, you don't give it enough exercise, it's naughty, it chews everything, it wrecks your house. Yeah. You give it enough exercise, it sleeps soundly when it's in the yeah, house, right? Yeah. I think kids need that expression of them, their physical self as well as all this intellectual stuff. So I'm really passionate that sport and music can engage kids in a way that the more academic subjects or intellectual interests don't do. Mm-hmm. And particularly for the kids at risk, I think it's a wonderful way of reaching out. And, and many of our community trusts belonging to our EFL and Premier League clubs do a fantastic job using sport in their local communities. So I'm very passionate about that. And when we see, and I mean, you alluded earlier, didn't you, social cohesion and educational attainment, all those amazing things sport does, it does still seem that it's not quite recognised by government departments and it's not embedded in the system perhaps as we would like why is that that's a big question isn't it and what can we do yeah it's one of my biggest regrets (laughs) of my whole professional career because I feel I've been banging on about it for 50 years it's not that successive governments don't see the value in being physically active or sport 
it's just nobody's ever created no overall I mean I think under the Labour government from 97 through to 2010 we did begin to create an overarching strategy this can't be done piecemeal this has got to be Department of Health Department for Education Department of Culture Media and Sport and probably the Home Office in terms of uh, (laughs) those are the four though that have got to sit together and have a national strategy and what we get is lots of initiatives with money so it isn't money it's there's no coordination the analogy I would give is we've got money going straight to the athlete but we've got no coach we've got no team plan yeah, yeah. we've got no no way of making all these pots of money and all these initiatives make more sense yeah. and that's what's missing for me you know we somehow fail to get policy makers and politicians to be, to understand it I mean I think the only person who truly understood the power of sport as a political tool was Nelson Mandela you know, the way he wore the Springbok jersey as yeah, he presented yeah. the, the World Cup. That was an example of someone recognising that you could make a statement in a sporting arena that had massive political implications for his rainbow nation. We've not had politicians who, who've who been prepared to do that. I think the closest we had was Tony Blair. Mm. When Tony Blair was in office, he was passionate about sport and he really believed in it. You were sort of figurehead of school PE for so long through the Youth Sport Trust, eight years there. And then at that time of change of government and then suddenly to lose that funding, that must have been so heartbreaking at the time. How did you deal with that personally and, and to support your team and the PDMs and the people in the, in the, mm. out in the community? Uh, I mean, the worst part was all the phone calls I received from thousands of people, okay. head teachers, partnership development managers, school sport coordinators saying, please do something, please do something. And I tried everything. (laughs) There was nothing left in my repertoire. So it was like, you know, having started in 97 with a few bricks and a concept of a house and then slowly built the house and just about to finish putting the roof on, um, the house got burnt down. And it it was like watching it burning down with my hands tied behind my back, having spent essentially uh 13 14 years building it it was brutal and and the worst part was people's despair Mm. trying to deal with other people's despair but you know the one thing i always say is in life you have to have a strong moral purpose and you have to know why you do things beyond the practicalities of what you're doing and it was young Debbie Foote, 17, from Lincoln, who organised a march of 2012 young people up Downing Street, handed in a petition which she'd personally pulled together with 750,000 signatures on it. And they said they were going to do all this. They didn't want me with them. I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> but they said, we'd like to meet you on the green out here afterwards. And as I walked them, watched them walk back down Downing Street, with the taxis hooting and they all had safe school sports shirts on I suddenly remembered what my moral purpose was right and my moral purpose wasn't a structure or even a strategy it was could I use sport to empower young people to stand up for themselves to be proud to have the courage to take things on and there they were Mm. walking down the road towards me and I was thinking come on you stop feeling sorry for yourself and get back on the horse because I literally had been sitting in the stable really hoping it had all changed and it had gone Um, so at that point we rebuilt ourselves we started again and I remember showing the staff a picture of a boat tossing violently in the sea we had to let go two-thirds of our staff and about 3,000 people got made redundant in the system it was horrendous and uh, I remember showing this boat tossing in the sea and I said there are three questions as captain of the ship you ask yourself one is will the ship survive and I said this ship will survive because it's built on values and a set of beliefs that absolutely will hold it together secondly how many of the crew are you going to lose overboard Mm -hmm. and I said we've lost all the crew we're going to lose the ones that are on I've kept you because I want you to sail the boat and I know you can do it and the third question you ask yourself is, where the dickens is the land? <laughs> and I said, I haven't a clue, but together we'll work it out, right? And right now I don't know where we're going, but we'll find a way. Uh, you mentioned earlier that your career has almost had two pathways of that sport performance and getting the best from individuals and teams and then sport for good and the power to change lives. And you obviously chaired UK Sport at the 
most successful period in terms of uh, winning medals. So did you ever think that the performance of those athletes, because how did you see they could impact everyday people? Well, I, I think we sometimes believe that, that excellence can inspire people to participate. And I, I think to some degree it can. But you have to make sure that when those individuals show up to participate, there's coaches and others to help them. Otherwise, it's a bit, you, you know, it's like Wimbledon, you know, you watch it and kids rush down to the tennis court and there's a big hole in the tennis court yeah, yeah. and the net's not there and you can't get the ball over the net and suddenly you don't want to do it anymore. But if you provide the right coaching, the right support, the right opportunities. So I think it can help with participation. But I think more importantly, uh, something I was talking to Catherine Granger about yesterday, actually, which is... I think elite athletes, that the, the important part is not the medal or the success, it's the journey. And it's the journey uh, around the fact that they have to overcome barriers, they have setbacks, all the things that we all deal with in life and all children deal with. Mm. So for me, the, the success factors, what it takes to get to the top, is exactly the same things as it takes to get to the top in business, it gets to the top in anything. And if young pe we want to inspire young people, it's those stories that we need to tell, not lauding the medal, but yeah. understanding the journey. You, got, yeah, yeah. you know, if you listen to a Karen Carney, Catherine Granger, you know, Nicola Adam, you listen to the people who have done exceptional things, it's their journey that is incredible. Mm. The things they do to get where they want to, their determination, their resilience, their stick at it, their moments of self-doubt, their ability to come out of those, you know, all of that, all the traumas, all the ups and downs, that's what we all live through day yeah. in and day out. It's that that is the inspiration for me. I love the bell ringing. Shows where we are. <laughs> And obviously millions were spent in moving us up the medal table. And I just wonder whether you've ever had that internal conflict to think of how that money might have been spent in terms of embedding sport in schools, PE teachers, coaches, facilities, if that money had been used elsewhere. No, I, I, I've had that conversation many times, you know. It, 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 yeah. and, and the reality was the whole time we were spending money on elite sport, a Sport England was spending at least twice as much on participation and Sport Scotland and Sport Wales and Sport Northern Ireland. So it, it wasn't just... In isolation. Or... It, I, I think if, if, if I use the analogy of Formula One, you could argue Formula One is ridiculously expensive, and it is. But in terms of technological developments that affect day-to-day -day cars, in terms of new uh, ideas, new bits of industry, innovation, they're affecting mass car production all the time. Mm. Excellence in sport is one about dreams and showing people that dreams are possible. Two, it's about the pride of our nation. I mean, you know, whether you like it or not, London was exceptional. It transformed London's personality. People spoke to each other on the tube. People got up and chatted about things. It was completely different because it unites people. You know, 11.7 million watched the Lionesses play the semi-final against the USA. And, you know, you only have to see the pictures of people in pubs and, you know, it unites us in a way very little else can in this day and age. You know, we need to be united as a nation and sport can do that. Yeah. And you shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate that. We can't put a number on it, but we shouldn't underestimate it. You know, all this research that shows when your local football team wins, your productivity goes yeah. up in local business. There's a whole raft of reasons why sport matters. And sporting excellence, sporting participation should be good bedfellows and there shouldn't be a choice. It should be an integrated approach that uses excellence to drive what you're hoping to achieve, not just in participation, but in social and community development. Thanks. Okay, yeah, absolutely. And after your amazing time at UK Sport, you, you took the role as head of women's game at the FA. And I must confess, perhaps I covers, I was a bit surprised at the time. But what d attracted you to that role? Was it a difficult decision for you to make? Uh, yes, I did dither a long time, but only because of my age, let me say. Um, <laughs> I came out of my experience at UK Sport and I, I and my youth sport trust experience, and I genuinely thought it's time to give me Sue Campbell a bit of time and then Kelly Simmons and Martin Glenn the then CEO of the FA asked to meet me and uh, asked me if I 
would consider going in. And I, I remember the conversation with Martin. I said, look, Martin, I don't want to work five days a week. He said, well, how many days will you give me? I said, three. He said, OK. <laughs> and I thought, oh, dear, this isn't working very well. <laughs> like it's going well. <laughs> this isn't what I'm after. Um, I said, no, I don't want to be based. I, any, I want to be based at home. Yes, you can do that. I went, oh, OK. <laughs> uh, you know, so, and so it went. So eventually I, sa- I, sa- I did say no initially, and then I thought about it. And if you ask me why did I do it... Yes, of course, I love football. I've loved it since I was a child. But that wasn't the reason I did it. I did it because the FA is the most powerful brand in sport. You know, you might not like that, but it is. It speaks to millions of people in millions of homes. And I thought, I wonder if this is my last chance to really get girls and women's sport understood, valued and used as a driver for social change. Because if you can't do it with the FA, you probably can't do it. Mm. So... I came, and within a very short space of time, I was doing six days a week. <laughs> and always from <laughs> Always, home. never at home. Uh, but that's the nature of, of, you know, something where you're more of a missionary than you are. A jo- is I've never done a job, really. You know, I've, I've never really worked. I've been on a mission. And, and each mission I've had has just been, you know, that's driven me. Uh, I'm not really interested in a job. I'm never really worried about salaries. or None of those things bother me. You know, and I've got all these, you know, I'm a baroness and a dame, and, a, and you think, crikey. Um, <laughs> but I've never, I never set out to have those things, and it doesn't, I mean, well, it, I feel very privileged and I'm proud of those things, and I wish to goodness my parents were alive to see it all. It's not what motivates yeah, me. Yeah. I'm motivated by mission. And, and looking back in terms of women's football and the ban in 1920, nearly 100 years ago, isn't yeah. it, by the FA, how much do you think that has then impacted attitudes and mindsets today? Do you think that's still... Oh, it's, it it uh, gave us 50 years of silence, which wasn't... Um, Ideal. It wasn't perfect. <laughs> and the people who pioneered it, you know, in the 70s, I often, you know, you've heard me say on other things, you know, I, I stand on their shoulders. I mean, if that, those women hadn't had that courage to get involved, get it, drive it, begin to establish it again we wouldn't be where we are today but I do think we still have a long way to go to win hearts and minds that that women's game is is worthy of standing alongside the men's game I still think there are a lot of people who are patronizing about it there are a lot of people who are deeply sarcastic about it it is changing, but it'll change with a generation, and that's why what we're doing in schools really matters. Because if we get those little boys in schools to recognise girls can play, yeah, yeah. and we get those little boys to respect girls can play, as they come through, that this won't be a, an unusual thing to do, it'll be a normal thing to do. So what, when we're putting these programmes, yes, we're wanting girls to have fun, enjoy it, make friends, develop their social links, and play football. But we're also wanting boys to go, crikey, that girl can play. Yeah. And and I think we're hearing that. We're starting to hear that from the next it's generation. Next generation. It is a generational thing. However, you know, I've taken people to women's football matches who have virtually had to drag, scream, screaming and kicking to get them there. And within 10 minutes, they're going, oh, this is really good. Yeah, yeah, this is how football used to be. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's, there's no histrionics. There's endeavor there's hard work there's effort there's energy there's a lot of skill a lot of skill now i mean the women's super league is getting more and more and more skillful we're attracting world's best talent alongside england's best talent it's getting stronger and better and i think people people are respecting what it is and and you know when you can virtually fill wembley for a friendly yeah, international yeah. um which would have been nice if we'd won but you know it, when you can do that something's changing so we're changing but it's a big change, but you see, I think that's the big, the big excitement for me. Because if we can change that, I wonder if we can change people's attitudes to women's in business. I wonder if we can change people's attitudes to the way they, they are in families. I wonder if we can change attitudes to what's possible. If a little girl wants to be an astronaut, why shouldn't she? If a little girl wants to be a, an engineer, why shouldn't she? little girl wants to be a great football player why shouldn't she and if we can open that door in football i wonder if we can open other doors as well and that that for me is the exciting bit of this that's fabulous exciting and you mentioned the 11.7 million people that watched the lionesses in the world cup semi-final we've seen this massive shift even in the last two or three years what do you think's been the biggest catalyst well i think first of all we've had a very good uh, marketing team 
at the FA who've really focused, you know, simple things like the way, well, sit, they weren't simple, but things like the way we announce the team, you know, where we use celebrities yeah, yeah. to announce. So we've everything from Prince William to, to Bex to, you know, pop stars, I have to say, I didn't <laughs> recognise. I can't even think of their names, but, you know, everybody else did. Um, those were fantastic because that gave us massive eyes mm. on the game. So th there are two, two things that I think will grow the game. One is the quality of the product. So we have to keep working at improving the players, the coaches, the way we put on games, the whole thing has to get, the product, the whole product has to get more and more and more professional and look good uh, for people to want to come and watch it. And secondly, it's just getting eyes on the game. And, you know, it's getting consistent opportunities to view, which we don't still have, really. You know, we'd love a slot every weekend that you know is the women's mm. football slot. It varies. It's on, you know, red buttons or it's on this or it's on that or it's behind the paywall on BT, you know, all of which is great. And both BBC and BT have been fantastic. But we, the next deal that we do which will be done in 21, will be done shortly, but for the beginning of 21, has to be a combination of eyes on the game, consistently, regularly, and some behind the wall in order to bring in more money to spend on the game. So, uh, you know, we've made good marketing, good promotion, good coverage, and let's be honest, the quality of, of the lionesses. You know, people are not going to, 11.7 million are not going to watch if you're rubbish. No. And <clears throat> those girls deserve all the credit, all the plaudits that they can be given because many of them haven't really been supported until very recently, yeah, yeah. if you look at it. You know, there was, as youngsters, they cut their hair and called themselves all sorts of things in order to play in boys' teams. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, but they are, they are fantastic people. And I thought... Not just were they great players, but I thought they conducted themselves magnificently, even under some pretty heavy provo provocation against Cameroon. I thought they did exceptionally well as, as people. Women, yeah, absolutely. It was about a year ago now, actually, wasn't it, that the FA unveiled the biggest ever investment in uh, UK women's sport by brand when Barclays became the first sponsor of a WSL, three-year partnership and... 10 million banded about and obviously a really exciting element that you've alluded to before was the schools partnerships so how is that going and, and progressing are you pleased with that yeah, progress I mean, the, the Barclays investment is fantastic because it's the first time we've had a major sponsor who stepped over the line for the women's game only now I know they have <laughs> the men's game in other ways but this was really important to, to us to the FA and to the women's game so they've been a and and I think what's great about them is not just that they're sponsoring this and everybody understands sponsorship. This isn't a sponsorship. This is a partnership. And, and this is about Barclays themselves striving to improve the opportunities for women within the company and using this as a way of promoting women's excellence, women's pathways, all of the things that we've talked about. And really early on, we had the conversation about, you know, they wanted the Super League that's their main feature brand. But we talked about, you know, what's really important is how do we get youngsters into mm -hmm. this game at grassroots level? So they have funded 100 football school partnerships, which gives us a reach to about 6,500 schools. And the way they've done that is they've invested in people in each of those partnerships to be advocates for what we're doing, what we're trying to do, how we're driving change, organising teacher education and we have a team of 25 people at the FA, all physical education experts, uh, trained physical educationists and those 25 are running all out each training. So uh, we're training teachers to deliver, not importing others to deliver yeah. and I think that's a huge message that you know I've been a big advocate of. of uh, yeah, I mean we need to <clears throat> skill up our teaching workforce, not substitute it with yeah. other people. So Right now, early signs are really good. Very exciting to see the numbers that are starting mm. to come out. We've worked with Disney to produce a lunchtime and after-school programme as well. So we've got curriculum input with our PE team. We've got lunchtime opportunity, after-school opportunity. And Barclays have made that all possible. Um, and I'm really excited about where it's going and the potential, you know, 
depending on resources, but the potential to take that to every school in the country is incredible. Yeah, amazing, wouldn't it? I must say on Disney, I was a bit cynical at first on the Disney Princess, but actually it's not that at all, is it? It's The Incredibles, it's Guardians of the Galaxy, it's Marvel yeah. characters, it's actually yeah. the bigger Disney. So anyway, so I wanted to put that out there. That yeah. it is a, it's the amazing elements of Disney that well, inspire. Well, it's, 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 you know, one of the things that was really hit you in the face when you first went into the FA was that football was for certain girls, it wasn't for all girls. And we've got to make it for all girls. Yeah, yeah. So I don't mind if, if we associate it with femininity and feeling good about yourself. I want girls to do that. I don't think playing football means you've got to abandon those things. Yeah, yeah. I just think what we've got to value is being physical, athletic, rosy cheek from being outdoors. Those are the things we want to value, not makeup and sitting silently in a room looking at pictures of yourself. If we're going to change participation, we've got to change children's Perception of perceptions it. of themselves in that environment so aligning it with that sort of so you don't have a dissonance between being feminine and being athletic you have a oh I can do both those things mm. Disney's been great and Claire Daniels who works in our participation team is a genius in terms of the way she's worked with them to develop the materials to develop the stories it's great stuff kids love it very exciting and you mentioned um, obviously that's less of the marketing team and Fabulous Margena, all that she's done. It felt like last year there wasn't a week didn't go by we didn't hear another sponsor coming in to support the Lionesses and the women's game. So what do you think other sports might learn from what you have done as the FA in well, terms need of... Margena for a start. <laughs> yeah, um, they can't have her though. No, they can't have her. <clears throat> she's been excellent. But we also have Georgina who runs the marketing team. And we've had fantastic sport from within the FA. You do have to pinch yourself sometimes. I mean, football is football. It does attract people who want to get engaged with it. Uh, but I think... I think it's a combination of being unafraid to market your sport differently. You know, Disney is an example. Being unafraid to tackle the core issues. So I knew from the get-go we needed to put football into schools, but I knew we couldn't do it straight away. We'd got to build our, our reputation and, and, and find the resource to do it. So we did Wildcats. And Wildcats has turned out to be a fantastic programme, you know, a community-run programme, five to 11 year old girls come along have fun with your friends get a bit fitter and play some footy and it's been fantastically successful not just because it's introduced a lot of girls to football that might not have otherwise done it but you know my colleagues whose daughters all now are in wildcats programs say widened my group of friends Mm. given them massive confidence uh, much more self-assured and happy those things mean just as much to me as, as being good at football Absolutely. and and might not please everybody in football, I say that, but those things matter. And I think you have to establish your credibility at different levels before you can expect people to come in. And then I think in, the, in women's sport, we're not looking for people who simply want to stick a logo on your shirt. We're looking for partners. partners yeah. so and and for me... It isn't that they're buying football, they're buying that bigger mission. They're buying that belief that together we can change the life chances of women in our businesses, in society, through football. That bigger mission is what you sell. I think if you try to sell just the product, it's really hard to do that because often we in women's sport don't have the reach, we don't have the profile, we don't have the... You know, the wherewithal of the men's game. Yeah, Yeah. the eyeballs on the game. And I think there is something really exciting and different about the women's game because I think you can see that there are companies who really want to be part of that mission. It's that belonging thing again, right? Can we change society? Can we change women's chances in business and and, and in society as a whole? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can. And football's the tool. And I think that's why people are interested in working with us. Excellent. Clearly, you've had an extraordinary impact across your career. What, what kind of leader do you feel that you are? And, oh. have, and have you changed over those years? Oh, gosh, you'd have to ask the people I've worked with. <laughs> um, I'd like to think I am a missionary. So, as I've said on many occasions, I'm not always easy to handle because I'm very driven, I'm very determined, and I'm not easy to say no to. But if you work with me and alongside me and you're part of my team I'd like to think you feel empowered you feel taken care of you feel valued and you can be assured I'm going to help you get to the very top of whatever it is you want to do because I'm a coach I'm fundamentally a coach so I coach my my team as opposed to tell them 
I will disagree with them, but in the end, I'll let them go where they think is the right place to go because that's important. So I'll always challenge, but if they withstand the challenge and say, no, we still want to go that way, I'll say, okay, so be it. It doesn't always work out, but that's how people learn. Mm. You can't you can't learn for people. A very wise man called Jim Greenwood, who oh. was a rugby coach at... at uh, He's my personal tutor at Loughborough. Oh, lovely, lovely man. man. Yeah, he, he said to me... That great coaches were not people who knew what to tell you to do, but people who knew you to tell you where to look. In other words, great questions rather than just giving answers all the time. And I'd like to think that's what I am like as a as a leader internally. Externally, I think I'm quite hard to handle at times. <laughs> and I'm sure there are people in the FA who will be sad to see me go, but also delighted <laughs> to see me go uh, because I have really been a bit of a pain. But if you want to change things, you're disruptive. Yeah, and you don't have to be disruptive for the sake of being disruptive. You know, it's not about taking a hammer and smashing things. But it is about saying, this won't do. This status quo doesn't mm. do. And and you have to learn different strategies to tackle status quo. It isn't always thundering in and, and throwing your fists around. But equally... Yeah, I am disruptive and I will I will do what it takes to get the job done. But I, th- I hoped if you talked to my colleagues, they would tell you they feel very supported and empowered. Excellent. Uh, so for young women now entering the sports sector and coming in today, looking to progress in their careers, what advice would you give? Are there a couple of gems of advice you'd give? Be sure you know your passion. You know, if it's the development of excellence or if it's using sport to affect change in others or it's your desire to help humanity through a thing you're good at called sport, then just be clear about what that is. It took me a while to work that out. I mean, certainly my teaching first few years helped me enormously. But, you know, I think it's important you know your passion. And then I think you have to be prepared to... Put yourself in different environments so you learn. So, you know, if you think about it, I taught in a really difficult environment when I first came out of college. Then I went into a relatively easy environment at Leicester University where I did a master's degree so I could train and I think I was called the assistant director of recreation, which was kind of, you know, not a hugely demanding job, but it allowed me to both train as an international player and study for a master's degree. I then moved to Loughborough, this incredible centre of excellence and fascination with, you know, the Seb Coes, the Clive Woodwards, the David Moorcrofts, all those guys were students when I was a tutor there. And then I had that yearning to go back to the inner city, so I bobbed back, much to everybody's amazement, did four years in the inner city. Mm. So my journey has not followed a logic. Mm. You know, if you've got in your mind some sort of pathway to the top, yeah, doesn't it doesn't work, work like that. It's so exciting. follow follow your mission, but allow yourself to go with those opportunities that come your way that, that might not make a linear sense, but ultimately will fall into place. So, you know, here I am at a ripe old age of 110. <laughs> um, you know, if I drop into football and suddenly all my worlds come together. Yeah. And so you go, crikey, now I know why I did inner city work. Now I know why I did <clears throat> New Sport Trust. Now I know why I did UK Sport. But did I know that's where I was going? Yeah. No, I didn't. So find your passion, work blooming hard, follow your dream, and don't be frightened to move around. What an extraordinary woman. I'm so grateful to Sue for finding the time to speak with me. You can see why she's had such an extraordinary impact on the sporting landscape. And thanks also to Barclays for sponsoring this series of The Game Changers. Their support enables us to take the stories of these amazing women to a whole new audience. I'd love to know what you think about The Game Changers. So please do leave a review or give us a rating or you could message me on social media at Sue Anstis or find the podcast at The Game Changers on Twitter, Instagram or Facebook. It's been incredible to hear how inspired people are by the stories of these fearless women in sport. If you could spread the word about the Game Changers podcast across your own networks too, that would be brilliant. And why not encourage your friends, family and colleagues to listen as well. Next week, I'm talking to Jo Tung, football agent, director of Women in Football and an ardent campaigner for equality in sport and the media. Jo spent 10 years editing 606, BBC Five Live's flagship football phone-in and is now CEO of Tongue Tide Management, 
a leading sports agency specialising in talent management and production. Press boxes were very, very intimidating. There were lots of assumptions. You know, you'd turn up to collect your media pass and you'd be directed to the catering door or you'd go into the press room, where's the team sheet, love? Where's the, you know, where's the coffee? The Game Changers. Fearless women in football. <laughs>